So this section is about neuromuscular um, and musculoskeletal disorders in children. Um, some of it is stuff you already know um, that you've learned in med, med surg and other classes. Um, we won't directly go over that, much like some of the other content we've discussed that um, you have discussed in other classes, but you still need to be responsible for it. Um, so for instance, musculoskeletal dysfunction, especially chapter 27 in your ATI book that regards fractures, um, this is information you should know, like using Riced for treatment, um, monitoring your five P's for her perfusion, things like that. You should still know that, so make sure you read those chapters, um, chapter 27 and chapter 28 in your ATI book um, for musculoskeletal disorders, even though we won't directly cover those very um, in much detail. Um, we're going to focus more on the things you see more in children um, that we have a greater focus on than you um, focus on in the adult population as much. Um, so probably the most common disorder that we see in children related to neuromuscular is cerebral palsy. As we talked about with newborns, um, cerebral palsy is not a genetic disorder. This isn't something where you have a genetic dysfunction um, that's DNA based. Cerebral palsy is related to typically some kind of injury to the brain. Um, injury, not necessarily traumatic injury. Um, it can be traumatic injury like with shaken baby syndrome. This is where they can get a later on acquired cerebral palsy. Um, they can be born with it from an anoxic brain injury, for instance, if they get a nuchal cord in utero where the cord gets wrapped around their neck and they have a loss of oxygen, um, this can result in cerebral palsy as well. So most commonly related to some kind of brain injury, bleed on the brain is another one. Um, so it's more common than you think. So cerebral palsy has to do with a disruption of the, the nerve functions um, in the brain telling the muscles how to work. Um, sometimes it's totally unknown how they get it. So there's four types, basically three main types, whereas the fourth one is called a, a mixed type, um, where they'll have a combination of the two. Make sure you know the differences in the types of cerebral palsy and the symptoms that are associated with each one. So typically in all forms of cerebral palsy, unless it's very severe, um, it's difficult to diagnose in infancy. It's as they start meeting or lack of meeting milestones that they realize that um, there is something wrong and they'll look more into it. It's not like you can do a blood test or even a muscle biopsy to diagnose cerebral palsy. So it's more symptomatic based um, and generally when they start having um, gross motor delays is when they will start to um, diagnose this. So um, the most common one of a large majority of uh, cerebral palsy patients have um, what's called spastic cerebral palsy. Um, so with spastic cerebral palsy, often these patients at rest, uh, their muscles are calm, but any kind of stimulation, it could even be just you coming in and verbally talking to them, any kind of stimulation causes spastic movements of the muscles, um, often jerking-like movements. They have very hypertonic, tight muscles. Um, these patients are often prone um, to getting contractures at their bed bound. Um, so they're having spasms and spasticity with at rest at, at, with movement at rest. Their their muscles are calm. They're just laying there. Um, one of the most common medications we give to these patients with spastic cerebral palsy is baclofen. Baclofen is a great drug for um, the spasticity that they experience. Um, it, it sometimes it progresses to where they need surgery, where they do um, a tendon release. Basically, they clip the tendon. Um, they it can calm them down. It also works for contractures. Um, the problem is it, it decreases their um, their ability to, to use that um, extremity um, like they normally would. Um, the other one, athenoid or dyskinetic, um, they have um, more writhing kind of movements, unusual movements. Um, and then instead of just spastic where they're shaking back and forth, it's more um, like repetitive movements. Um, 
and then your ataxic. Um, these are typically patients that are ambulatory but have a lot of difficulty with ambulation. If you look at the picture um, at the bottom, this is called scissor walking, which you'll see with ataxic um, cerebral palsy. It's where they cross their knees. Um, and if you have this PowerPoint open while you're viewing um, this recording, um, if you click on that picture, it will take you to a video on YouTube um, that shows you what that scissor walking looks like, but it's where they kind of cross their knees and point their toes as they're walking, um, having to do with that abnormal gait that they experience. So it can be very difficult for them to ambulate, if they're even ambulate to all, at all. Um, so these classifications are discussed on page 1,456 in your textbook. And then on 1,457, um, the manifestations are listed. This includes both early signs um, that may you may see before they're even diagnosed, um, leading up to those symptoms you see at diagnosis. Um, so make sure you're reviewing that. Make sure you know the four types of cerebral palsy. So how do we treat cerebral palsy? So there's no cure for cerebral palsy. Once damage has been done to the brain, you can't reverse that typically. Um, so it's more management of symptoms. Um, it is focused on maintaining whatever function they have at that time and not letting them um, get worse. Um, sometimes you can't help it and they do progressively get worse, but with appropriate physical therapy and occupational therapy, um, oftentimes they can maintain some of their functionality. Um, um, so management often involves um, things like exercises to um, improve either hypotonicity or hypertonicity, depending on what they have. And some patients have both. Um, they have some muscles are very tight. Some muscles are very loose. Um, again, medications to help with symptoms. Baclofen is a huge medication that we use for symptoms. Um, so wearing braces, wearing things that maintain um, preventing contractures, um, allowing them to walk. Um, again, appropriate positioning and positioning devices. Um, sometimes they'll do, um, I mentioned where they'll do the tendon release. There's also something called a dorsal root rhizotomy where they actually clip um, the nerves in the spine, basically, um, next to the spine um, that helps them um, decrease um, that sensation that leads to those spastic movements. Um, so those are often very promising to patients as well. So another common thing we see, and we've discussed this before with newborns, is neural tube defects. Um, there, there's basically four different types. There's many, many, many different types. Um, the ones we'll focus on, though, is the difference in spina bifida occulta, spina bifida cystica. So spina bifida occulta is the picture you see all the way to the left. Um, this is where it is underlying. Um, so there is no sac on the outside of the body. Um, it is still fully enclosed um, by the overlying structures. Um, it's just that it's pouched out a little bit from where it normally would be within the spinal cord. Um, oftentimes these patients have a little bit less severe symptoms and let me show you some pictures um, so this would be like right here where you see the tuft of hair or over here you see that dimple right above the the sacrum um, so these bottom pictures are your spina bifida occulta it's occulta meaning hidden um, so these patients often have less severe symptoms they don't have that high risk of infection like we worry about with newborn newborns that have spina bifida cystica. So spina bifida cystica is where you have um, the meningocele and the myelomeningocele, the two that you see all the way to the right. So the difference in meningocele and myelomeningocele is what is actually in that pouch on the outside of the body. Um, meningocele is just the meninges and cerebrospinal fluid versus a myelomeningocele is more severe. You've got the meninges and cerebrospinal fluid, but you also have the cord poking out into that sac as well. So those are typically patients that have more severe symptoms. Um, oftentimes, once they're born, even when they correct it and have surgical interventions, um, they're still going to have long-term complications, everything from um, urine and bowel problems to per complete paralysis sometimes. So it varies from patient to patient. 
just last year, they have started been, being able to successfully um, surgically treat spina bifida in utero um, and have been very successful. Um, obviously, this is something that will take years to determine the true long-term outcomes of these um, to figure out if they're going to have any long-term um problems um, but it looks very promising they are seeing babies that are born with none of those um, paralysis or long-term complications um, which is very very good um, so on page 1461 in your textbook it talks about the different types so you can see uh, another description of the different types um, and then on 1463 it talks about the clinical manifestations of um, those different types and what you may see. So going back to our picture, talking about the spina bifida cystica, these are the pictures that you see on top where you actually see that sac on the outside of the body. So what do we do about neural tube defects? Well, like I mentioned, there is surgery. Um, if they have a cystica, they have to have surgery because we've got to put that sac back on the inside of the body um, because it can potentially rupture, which is a huge risk for infection. Um, not to mention the longer that it goes on, the, the worse it will cause permanent complications. Um, so in order to, the best way for neural tube defects is prevention. And one way we can prevent that is to promote um, high folate or folic acid diets in, in pregnant women. Um, and really before they get pregnant, ideally women of childbearing age should be on a prenatal vitamin before they ever get pregnant because usually once you know you're pregnant it's too late and that neural tube has already formed um, so really ch women of childbearing age should be on a prenatal vitamin ideally or, or increase their folic acid um, at all times um, so when we're talking about a newborn that has still has an open sac we talked about this with um, newborn care we want to lay them in a prone position um, we want to uh, maintain the integrity of the sac with sterile moist gauze um, until that is perfect per repaired. Um, we are very worried about infection in this population. Um, sometimes these babies are preterm. Um, not always, um, but making sure we're monitoring for infection like decreased feeding, lethargy, acting differently. Um, and then um, preventing infection until they can have that surgery. Um, the most, pretty much every single patient um, who has spina bifida of some type have some kind of urine or bowel issues. You need to know that every single patient has some level, not always severe. It can be to the point where patients have to self-cath in order to void. Um, they can never void on their own. It can also be just where they have some urinary retention. A girl I went to nursing school with, um, you would have never known she had spina bifida she had she her gait was fine um she was able to function normally but she was telling me the only symptoms she has is that she gets a lot of urinary tract infections because of that urinary retention so it's not always obvious those symptoms associated with it but every patient um with spina bifida has some level of bowel or bladder dysfunction Oftentimes, these patients are labeled with latex allergies from birth. Now, as we're seeing more and more products that are latex-free, you're not seeing that problem. But these patients have such high exposures to latex just from having to self-cath um, early on, starting in infancy, that they, if they don't have a latex allergy, they develop one um, because of that constant exposure. Um, so often these children are, or even if they have never had a reaction, will be labeled with a latex allergy to prevent that constant exposure. Now, now that we're not, we have so many more latex-free products, it's not as much of a problem, but it used to be. So one that's a little bit less common, but you may or may not have heard of, um, something called muscular dystrophy. Um, so there are many different types of muscular dystrophy. We're going to focus on Duchenne's muscular dystrophy because it is the most common. Um, they often have different, a little bit different presentations. Um, they may, they have different demographics that they speak to as far as um, girls versus boys, um, but overall some of the symptoms are relatively the same. Um, so with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, because it is an X-linked disease, um, it's almost exclusively in boys. Um, 
Typically, these children look fine when they're born and around toddler age, three or four years old, when they're starting to meet those major gross motor milestones, um, like learning to ride a bike, for instance, um, they start to revert backwards. They start to regress in, in their milestone completions. Um, so there is no cure for muscular dystrophy at this time. It is progressive. Um, they will get progressively weaker and weaker. Typically, these children die um, within their 20s or so. Um, you are seeing ones live into their 30s and 40s now. Um, but because of that progressive weakness, it leads to often they need a tracheostomy um, and then a ventilator because they your respiratory muscles can't maintain their respirations. And when that happens, um, they develop things like pneumonia um, and inability to maintain respirations. And that is usually what they die of is some kind of respiratory complication. Um, so with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, some of the symptoms include um, where they have um, what a waddling gait. So um, in normal growth and development, and this is something you're going to want to know in normal growth and development oftentimes um toddlers are bow-legged or not need meaning uh, and that's what makes them waddle kind of when they run or walk um and bow-legged meaning their, their knees kind of bow out um, or curve out so so you expect that in a toddler but if they're going on four or five years old and they still have that waddling gait that can be a sign of some kind of neuromuscular disorder so bow-legged not need is totally normal in your toddler not normal as you get to be a little bit older um so another thing you see is Gower sign. So what it is with Gower sign is they, they are unable to just lift themselves up from a sitting position to a standing position. So they actually use their hands to push their body up um, to they'll use their hands to walk, kind of walk up their body. Essentially, if you again, if you're following along on the PowerPoint with this video, um, on your PowerPoint, click on the picture and it will bring up a video showing you what Gower's sign looks like. Um, so these symptoms are listed on page 1471 in your textbook. You are going to want to know these. You need to know the signs. Um, so as it progressively gets worse, they often become bed bound. Again, oftentimes these patients need tracheostomies um, by the time they're in their late teens, early 20s. Um, their muscles progressively atrophy. Oftentimes they have um, large calf muscles um, based on their disorder. Um, so the way this is diagnosed, this can be diagnosed with a muscle biopsy. So this is genetic. This isn't due to an injury. This is genetic. Um, so they'll do muscle biopsies um, and there's enzymes they can look for in the blood that will, that will confirm this diagnosis. So how do we manage it? So the only way to really manage Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is um, management of symptoms and hopefully decreasing how rapid they decline because they are going to decline. It is progressive. There is no way to stop the progression, um, but there are ways to kind of decrease complications and to decrease um, the how fast it progresses. Um, they're trialing various different medications and things like that, but there's nothing on the market to truly attack the Duchenne's itself. So um, the primary goal is to maintain function as long as possible, keep them active, um, encouraging them to to participate in activities as they can um, because muscles are, I know you've heard this before, our body is, if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, and this goes for them even more so if they are not using those muscles, they are going to decline much more rapidly. Um, but the treatment is really only um, supportive. So one thing um, that you don't see a lot, but it's important to catch because it can get pretty severe is botulism. So with botulism, it is a type of food poisoning um, where you get the Clostridium botulinum toxins um, in, in your blood and it causes 
progressive neurological dysfunction to the point of paralysis. Um, so the reason this is important is because of teaching parents how children can get this. So this is the reason we teach parents no children under the under the age of 12 months should get honey products. Um, C. Diff, or C. diff, listen to me, <laughs> Clostridium botulinum, um, botulism can um, grow in in honey. Um, so children under the age of 12 months shouldn't have honey, but um, it can also be um, seen in corn syrup. The the one patient I've had with botulism years ago, um, the mom had given the baby um, k syrup or corn syrup um, for constipation. I don't think people really do this much anymore, but occasionally you'll see where people use that. And it um, the baby got botulism from that because the corn syrup was produced in the same factory as honey products. So when you're talking about older children and adults, um, that you can get this from um, home canned foods can cause it if they're improperly sterilizing can or um, rusted cans. So this is the reason they tell you don't eat out of um, foods that out of rusted cans um, because that's where botulism can come from. Um, so typically symptoms start to show up within um, a day or so, pretty rapid, um, and it they have progressive um, worsening of paralysis. Um, until they are paralyzed with their respiratory muscles and of course that's the big concern is that their respiratory muscles will be paralyzed and they can't breathe which absolutely can happen um, and probably will happen um, so the manifestations are on page 1476 but it is that progressive um, weakness and paralysis um, so treatment for this is supportive. Um, these children will get intubated because they're going to have respiratory failure from the, the paralysis. Um, so they will be intubated. Um, a big thing with botulism that's a little bit different um, than most of your bacterial infections is Botulism is anaerobic. This also goes with tetanus as well. We don't really directly talk about tetanus, but tetanus is the same way in the fact that it is um, anaerobic. Um, going back to your microbiology, um, a big thing with anaerobic bacteria is when they are destroyed, they release toxins, lots of toxins. So if you give antibiotic and you are killing and um, causing phagocytosis of a whole bunch of bacteria at one time, those toxins can over overload the system much more than the bacteria. So even though the bacteria is making them sick, the toxins is really what's going to put them over the edge. And if you kill a bunch of them at the same time, um, it can send them into crisis. So um, instead of antibiotics with botulism, we do not give antibiotics, even though it's a bacterial infection. Same thing with tetanus. Um, tetanus is also anaerobic, so we don't give antibiotics for that one either. Um, the treatment for this is immune globulin, or IVIG, specially, specifically botulism immune globulin, um, to help the body fight the infection, um, as opposed to giving antibiotics that's going to cause a rapid phagocytosis of these bacteria. Um, so we will give IVIG immune globulin and and supportive measures they may need depending on how long typically if patients are intubated and cannot receive nutritional support for more than three days um, they'll get um, they'll get TPN and things like that so um, that they'll be intubated until it subsides typically a couple weeks or so is how long they have to be intubated for and then it resolves on its own um, usually um, but supportive treatment. There's no way to really treat the botulism itself um, other than giving immune globulin to help the body fight that infection. So a couple of musculoskeletal ones specifically we're going to talk about related to children. Again, you need to read those musculoskeletal chapters. Um, because there's going to be things like on fractures and stuff that you, you should know. You've already learned in med surge, but um, we're not going to directly go over them because that doesn't change with children. Um, so one of the things you do see in children, um, you'll see it called either juvenile idiopathic arthritis is the term you're seeing more and more now today, GAIA. Um, but it's the same thing as what most people know as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or JRA. Um, it is related to a post-strep infection. 
action. So we talk about strep a lot in this class. Strep is one of those things that um, it scares you. <laughs> and it's not the strep infection itself. Strep is relatively self-limiting, um, even if you don't get treatment for it. However, in children specifically, the big concern if you don't treat strep is the post effects. Um, everything from heart complications to um, neurological complications to a more common one, connective tissue and joint um, complications. And when they develop juvenile arthritis, um, rheumatoid arthritis, it is permanent. It's not reversible. So this is where the strep um, attacks those, uh, not the strep itself, but the immune response of the body. It's an autoimmune response that's attacking those connective tissues. Um, so oftentimes they will have strep burst. Um, they will get rheumatic fever where within a couple weeks of that strep, um, they may get um, fevers and a rash. Um, this can is categorized by however many joints are involved. Um, treatment for this is going to be to maintain functionality of those joints, promoting mobility. Um, telling them even if it hurts you need to be moving those joints because if you don't use it you lose it like I said before um, so I mentioned before when we talked about care of children that we never give aspirin to children except for in a few very specific circumstances and this is one of them um, especially when they have that initial onset of the the JRA symptoms we give them aspirin it decreases that inflammatory response now you wouldn't want to give it to them when they are um, at other times when they have um, acute infections um, because um, if they have flu or if they had chicken pox it could stimulate that rye syndrome uh, but this is one of those things we do give aspirin for is JRA um, commonly um, a drug that they use to um, impair the immune system so that it's not overreacting as methotrexate. Um, you've probably learned already we use methotrexate for a lot of things, not just chemotherapy. Autoimmune disorders often um, methotrexate is kind of that first line um, and this is definitely one of those that we use methotrexate for as well as steroids. Often these children develop um, Cushing's disease over time. Um, children and adults, you'll see adults that have had JRA for all their life and they'll have those symptoms of Cushing's because they've been on steroids for, for decades sometimes. Um, in the initial Onset bed rest is absolutely important, and the reason bed rest is so important, not so much for the JRA, um, but if they're having that initial onset of that rheumatic um, infection or rheumatic um, reaction, um, then bed rest can hopefully decrease their risk of developing cardiac complications related to the rheumatic fever. Um, so bed rest, um, heat application to those joints to help with pain. Um, and again, exercises using active range of motion exercises, even passive range of motion, um, whatever it takes to move those joints so that um, you can prevent contractures, it will improve pain, it will improve mobility as well. Um, so typically this disorder um, is is they're not it's not all the time um, they have periods of remissions and exacerbations that go back and forth so ma maintaining um, pain management during those periods of exacerbations is really the only treatment for it you can't get rid of it um, once you have it it is permanent so that's why strep is so important to take seriously and treat because the complications of strep um, r rheumatic complications of strep are permanent Last one specifically to children we'll talk about is scoliosis. So typically this starts in your prepubescent to early pubescent children. Um, it is more common in girls than boys. Um, there are pictures on page 1445 um, in your book um, showing you what scoliosis is. So um, you have three basic spine um, malalignments. You have kyphosis, which is like your hunch backwards curved forward. You have your lordosis, which is where you're curved backwards. Think of a pregnant woman, they you often have lordosis. And then scoliosis is a lateral curvature like you see in um, picture C. So with scoliosis, um, there does seem to be a genetic component to it. Um, but it is more common in girls, like I mentioned. So the only treatment for this is to hopefully catch this early enough to correct 
um, the malalignment. Um, the way they catch this, um, they use to, some schools still do this, some schools don't do it anymore, but pediatricians now definitely do it um, where they, they check you. So what they're looking for, um, you probably remember this from being in school, um, you, you clap your hands in front of you at the level of your shoulders and then you bend forward at the waist and they can look at the curvature of the spine. Um, you want to make sure they don't have a shirt on when you're doing this because you it you you can't really adequately assess that curvature with a shirt on. Um, other things when they're standing up straight before you have them bend over, you look at their shoulders or their shoulders level um, and their hips as well. You can see in picture C um, how her shoulders are, the left shoulder is a little bit higher and then the hip on the right is a little bit higher than the left. So you'll have that malalignment of the hips and shoulders and that can give you an idea as well. So treatment is going to depend on the severity. Oftentimes they'll try what you see on the bottom, which is called the Milwaukee brace. Um, this is a brace that is worn for 23 hours a day. They are allowed to take it off one hour a day to shower and, and things like that. Other than that, they wear it when they sleep. They wear it at all times, often for several weeks to months um, to hopefully realign that spine. Um, if that doesn't work, then surgical interventions are necessary where they'll do a spinal fusion for realignment. Um, but the treatment is aimed at preventing worse malalignment of the curvature and hopefully realigning that to, to put it back um, within a normal curvature.